The gang's all here. Happy Wednesday, you guys. Happy hump day. <laughs> hey, Robin. Hey, Adam. I'm welcome happy to be to, here. Welcome to the Saratoga podcast. Uh, happy to be back, especially, I feel like the three of us haven't been on for a couple of weeks. It's been a minute. It's been a little bit. Kids vacations, Easter break, all that stuff. It's, it's I know. Up. All that jazz. And yet, while all that's going on, the city council keeps churning. And here we are, ready to report on a lot of stuff, including the city council meeting last night. Should we just get right into it? Go for it. Do it. All right. So city council recap, there were three public hearings. I think not, there weren't a whole lot of people there for these public hearings. Um, one was a public hearing on uh, short-term rentals, which has been open for several council meetings now. Um, there was also a public hearing on the trucks, I think on Van Dam. Correct. Adam, I don't know if you have any insight on that because I know you're involved a little bit tangentially. Yeah, yeah. So there was, so to be honest with you, I, I, it was left there was a public hearing. There wasn't much, um, you know, Chris Matisson was there. He, he seems to speak on everything. Uh, he was kind of defending himself against, uh, you know, the accusations that he was the one who directed the truck traffic there when he was commissioner of public safety. Um, the big thing, though, is I know that I know the group is planning to turn out for the next public hearing. I know there's another one coming up. And right. uh, this, this is this is an adamant group who, who really who really it, once you start to look at what what is going on in Van Dam with just the volume of trucks that go down that road and the exhaust that they're putting into the air and the fact that they don't need to be there, that a lot of these trucks are just using Saratoga as a shortcut to, to bypass, you know, to shave 20 minutes, 30 minutes off their, their route. When they could be staying on the interstates the whole time, uh, I, I I believe they're a a, a very vocal, a very energized group, but rightfully so because this is a really this is something that's really impacting their community, and and a lot of people say there's not easy solutions, but I I disagree. I think there's there's hard solutions, but there's there you know it's like a war of attrition. There's easy things that can be be done, but we'll talk about that later after the next public hearing. But I know I know that's I know that's going to be. That they're going to be fired up for the next public hearing. I know they're, they're turning out for that. Yeah, because I saw that at the end of the public safety agenda, like at the very end of the meeting, there is um, an announcement that they were going to continue to set the public hearing on this issue. And there were two letters attached to the agenda for last night that pertain to it. One was from the state DOT saying that was addressed to Mayor Safford saying that uh, basically it was unlawful for us to have taken down the weight limit signs. And then the other letter was from Dave Harper, the city attorney, saying that he found the state DOT's kind of review of the legality correct. And so it didn't give me any insight as to how we would kind of wiggle around this. Right, right. Well, yeah. I, I, I guess we'll find out the next, the next public, you know, the next public hearing meeting. And, and again, the answer might not be a weight limit. The answer might right. be enforcement of other regulations. Right. Uh, again, I don't speak for the group, but I know I know they are adamant about finding a solution pretty much to, to keep the trucks on the highways where they belong. Well, we, sh we should invite someone on um, next week to talk about it from the group. I, yes. Yes. And I have somebody perhaps uh, I'll talk to you afterwards. I just want to give my take on it as a retired police officer. I'm a bit baffled. And Adam, you touched on it here. I'm a bit baffled why the city police department can't at least enforce the traffic law and people say, well, they undid the traffic division. Well, they're trained police officers that can pull over a vehicle and still uh, 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 address, a, you know, they still write tickets in the city. And granted, they don't have scales and things like that. I understand that. But when I was a trooper on the road, I could look at any truck and there was probably a violation there. And I'm not saying harass them, but I'm saying if you're going to drive through our city, you will comply with the safety law. The safety laws. Your lights will work. Your logbook will be up to date. Your your um, your mud flaps will be there. Every piece of equipment will be there. I can look at any truck to this day and say that's a violation. That's a violation. I don't know why the city is so stymied in just enforcing basic safety laws of the vehicle and traffic law on the trucks coming through the city. I think a former public safety commissioner I can chime in. I can chime in on that because so when I took office in 2019, I brought up this issue and asked Chief Crooks about it at the time. And 
we didn't have anyone in 2019, this is what I was told, like certified or like trained to do, to pull over a truck and like know what to write a ticket on. And so we sent someone off to be trained in it. So we had at least one police officer who could pull over a truck. That was what I was told. And that was the action we took at the time. But from what you're telling me, the state trooper, as a state trooper, maybe there's no special like certification needed. You could have just you just Absolutely. at least for some obviously for weighing the trucks and so forth that's pretty advanced i i was not uh, capable of doing that and have the equipment i'd end the training but again if if there's some basic safety equipment if he doesn't have lights or he's missing a tail light or a brake light or a mud flap or you have a reason to pull him over then when i got up in the in in in, in the cab i'd say let me see your logbook I, I could train a, a you know they learn some of this in the academy these are basic a lot of these are basic vehicle and traffic and some other laws relating to traffic that could be enforced by any police officer um, yeah. with either minimal refresh or uh, again if, if the taillight's not working and again i, I don't want to say uh, ticky tack harass them but damn it if you're coming through my city on on that street that has a problem with the truck traffic you better have your safety equipment up to date you better be going the speed limit you better have your logbook up to date i don't know why the police department cannot do at least some basic level enforcement of the law I, and i'm not criticizing them there may be a legitimate reason as you touch on robin but i'm just a little baffled yeah no i totally agree because it seems like just with truck traffic in general and what routes they take it's really the path of least res resistance and like what's going to get them there fastest so if saratoga springs starts to be a place where cutting through the city becomes you know onerous time consuming if there's inspection spots or they get pulled over frequently they will just naturally reroute is my kind of understanding of how the mindset of the truck the trucker is yes nothing wrong with stri strict enforcement not harassment but strict strict even keeled enforcement totally agree totally agree um there was also another public hearing on the short i think i mentioned this already the short-term rentals which we are going to talk about a little later with a guest who is an expert on the topic of short-term rental regulation and policy so we will get to that a little bit later um public comment period was a little more subdued compared to what we've seen in the last couple meetings um there were a few comments. Uh, Pastor Earl Wallace came back again um, to talk about his um, interaction with Saratoga BLM four years ago. This is kind of an ongoing comment. Um, he was there, I believe, at the last city council meeting and was commenting about it as well. Um, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second because I thought yeah. I thought he, had, he he brought up a very interesting point of a couple of city councils meetings ago. Uh, you know, the Saratoga BLM uh, showed up with a lot of Skidmore students and they attempted to, again, filibuster the meeting by using their three minutes, you know, they talk for a minute and then pause for two minutes waiting for an apology. At the end of that meeting, uh, they, the, or the end of the public comment, they did get an apology from uh, commissioner of finance, Manita, uh, commissioner of accounts, uh, Dylan Moran and C commissioner of public works, Jason Golub. But pastor o. Wallace, um, as a, as a black man was up there saying, listen, these people you were uh, apologizing to, especially the leader of Saratoga BLM, called me the worst. Every the, the worst things you could you could call you know a, a person of color. And where's his apology for that? And why are our elected officials? You know they, they're representing all of us. And in these apologies, you know they're really apologizing. What you, you know they're they're in in, in, in their apology they're in, uh, they're making it sound like we have a racist police force. I mean, there's a lot that goes into these apologies, and he was saying that these apologies were basically pandering. And, and I believe he was right. I think it was a very good point by him. He he made an interesting point. He said, you know, some people were saying, well, that was four years ago. He's saying some of the things they're complaining about were centuries ago. So I, I, I don't know how valid of an argument that is, but I found it interesting. I mean, he certainly was, you can watch the video. He certainly was a victim of hate speech. I mean, there's no, there's no questioning that. And um, he, well, he even said, he said potential violence too, and it would have gotten out of control if it was not for the SSD. Yes. He said he was almost physically assaulted, I think, uh, yeah. my interpretation of what he said. I obviously do think that doling out kind of blanket apologies when there's issues that are this complex and nuanced is um, uh, dangerous a little bit as a, as a public official. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, I hope they're being very mindful of their words. Um, 
but it was it was interesting to have him back and i think he made a salient point you know in terms of his experience and then his experience with the city you know thereafter and and real quick too he made the point and i thought this was a very poignant point the last city council meeting i believe it was the head of the conservative party dave Buchan, got up and spoke and read verbatim what was said to the pastor uh, and it was words that we all agree as, you know, uh, uh, as white people, we should, the despicable words that no, no matter what context, there's never a context to actually say these words out loud for, you know, for, especially for us. Dave Buchan said it at these words out loud, which again, in, in, you know, his defense was he was just reading verbatim. What was, he, he was, he was, and, and the pastor, again, being an African-American, you know, did, did say he never met Dave before. They had met at that city council meeting and they had talked and Dave was going up there in, in seemingly defense of, of the pastor. So very, very complex issues, you, you know, yes. of, of, of race and, and the, the race relations that Saratoga is, is, you know, been thrust in the, in the, in the center for and is dealing with, but just wanted to make that point too about a, a Dave Buchan and, and the pastor. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's important context. Um, there was also another complex and nuanced public comment um that i think you heard as well adam from kristen dart correct yes yes so kristen dart got up there and and kristen dart ran for um public safety uh she ran as an independent but with the backing of the democratic party but not the endorsement but she's been at every meeting and she was and, and this is this is my issue with the, the again I, I keep on saying the far left is, is so caught up. The far left in Saratoga, the WAGA Democrats, as I say, is like the MAGA Republicans. It, it, she, she, she went after Meg Kelly and Meg Kelly's attorney's fees. And it's just, it's just like, a, it's living in the past. It's this vendetta. I don't know what it's for. I don't know what the point of her comments for. You know, Meg Kelly was our mayor. She, and, and Robin, you can relate to this in, 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 in the duties of her mayor. She is now uh, needs to retain um, a, a attorney representation. The city has an obligation to pay for that. And, and for, for Kristen Dar, who, and the reason I'm bringing her in, because I have a feeling she's setting up for another run, just yeah. bringing up these, you know, living in the past and these vendettas, I thought was, again, it's just, this is what drives me nuts with the local, you know, kind of wagon Democrats in this city. Right. So, I, I stand should I, do you want me to give a quick recap of her comment? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Please, you I missed it myself. Yeah. Um, so basically what she was saying was, she read from um, she read from the charter in terms of like what uh, the public officer's law is required to cover in terms of elected officials and attorney fees that they might incur while they're in office and that um, the city is obligated to cover anything that happened that was in basically the normal kind of scope of their duties in their elected office. Anything that happened that resulted from that should be is covered under this public officer's law. But then she pulled up a letter from Meg Kelly's attorney that was in response to the attorney general's report in which he writes that um, basically the things that she was accused of or um, were said to have done in the attorney general report would have been outside the scope of her governmental duties. And, and, you know, she didn't do them essentially. And, but they would have been specifically, the quote was like outside the scope of the, her governmental duties. So Kristen's point was, if, if the AG's report is describing behavior from the mayor that's outside the role of the mayor, then the public officer's law shouldn't apply and the attorney fees shouldn't be covered. Yo, well, here's my issue with that. And my issue with that is that in, in the AG report, they can be things that I don't think Meg said, and I don't think the attorney was saying everything in that report was outside of her scope as a mayor. I don't think the whole report. So, so the nuances of this is, is not something I think as a city, we should be taking up. The fact of the matter is the AG report, but you know, it's like the duck test. If, you know, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. This AG report, you know, regardless of what the, 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 the specific details that her attorney was referring to in that letter and we never really were provided which those specific details were. The idea that this AG report was not, she, she should not be covered because, you know, maybe one thing in that AG report was outside her scope as mayor, I think is ridiculous. If, if they, if the city did not represent her, she could sue the city. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I haven't, I'm going to go back and watch her portion of, of, of the public comment. 
uh, so I hear it directly. But what you're saying, that's just nonsensical. Her argument is is, is very nonsensical. Uh, what what it sounds like the attorney was saying were were she that had no legal effect. Whatever you're saying she, that she did had no legal effect because the mayor is not empowered to do that. But she's still mayor at the time. She's getting uh, and she needs legal legal representation for her time as mayor. How how is this for a uh, want help wanted ad? Become mayor of the city, work right. full time for fourteen grand a year, and not be indemnified. <laughs> so this was kind of my takeaway from that is that I'm not an attorney, right? So I I can't say if this argument has merit or not. To me, that's for attorneys to figure out. And like, Dan, you already have the vernacular to discuss it that I wouldn't have. However, what I think is dangerous about it is that these are not super popular jobs, these city council jobs. They pay, as you said, $14.5. That's $220 a week. They're full-time, full-time stress. You get full-time shit from people constantly. I mean, there's no glory, there's no fame, there's no, you know, big power. There, there's nothing, there's nothing sexy about them at all. And if you set this precedent of, you know, who knows what will happen during your two-year term, but there's a possibility that you could be sued and you personally will have to cover that cost. I don't know how you get someone to run for these offices. I mean, I just think that is a really scary notion. And I think it would be very difficult to get people to to sign up to run for these seats if if they're if it, it seems like you would be taking a huge personal risk. It it goes to your point, Adam, in that and I don't want to be dismissive or unfeeling. You know, me as a white person, I, I don't want to be dismissive of of the racial politics of the city. And, and I hope I'm not. But at the same time, Adam, as you said, there's sort of like we're, we're going backwards here. We're talking about things from years ago. We have a homeless problem in the city. We have so many other problems that are current, yet the energy in the room is off. To, to have the energy in the room sucked up by, to me, a nonsensical argument, why two mayors ago, two mayors ago, um, she should not be uh, represented that she's required, that the city is required by, by law and the charter to do is just is is just really hurting the city. Let's focus on the ho homeless. Let's focus on short-term rentals. Let's focus on the hundreds, if not thousands, of other issues current that this city needs to address. Well, here's how this played out. So, in the on the mayor's agenda, he had a resolution um, to cover the ongoing legal costs that were have been incurred by Meg Kelly, and it was a discussion and vote to be voted on last night. Um, and when it came up in pre-agenda, which happens on Mondays, and it's basically like a run through of the city council meeting, um, there was no argument by anyone, any of the other commissioners when it came up on the mayor's agenda. But when it came up last night, Commissioner Moran said specifically that he would never vote yes to covering the legal fees for someone who didn't comply with the attorney general's investigation. And then um, Manita, Commissioner Songvi brought up um, the conversation that apparently they'd had at another meeting where they discussed capping the legal fees that they would cover for a public official. And so there were some exchanges back and forth. The commissioner Cole then said, maybe this is better discussed in executive session. Commissioner Moran really took issue with that and was like, absolutely not. Ba, ba, ba. Long story short, uh, Commissioner Golub, I believe, suggested they table the resolution. And that's what ended up happening. There was no vote. They pulled it. Um, and it's tabled. I don't really know why, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I suppose to consult with the city attorneys, but they they could have called an executive session. I think that would have been probably the right course of action to have the executive session last night and vote on it and move along. Um, but that's not what happened. The, it, the resolution was tabled, which I was very surprised by. Um, oh, sorry, Adam, I've been talking. Let me, if you have something to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, it just, it just sets such a dangerous precedent it's what you see now going on at our federal level where, you know, today they're impeaching our Department of Homeland, uh, not Homeland Security, um, Mayorkas. What is his title? Um, the Alexander Mayorkas, he's one of the cabinet members for his work in the southern border. Listen, I think the southern border is a mess. I think the, 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 the administrators have me messed it all up. But this impeachment process is not, it's just, it, 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 it's taking a part of our government and, and, and it's an institution, it's, it's, it's a safety net, it's something with significant meeting and it's just bastardizing it for political gain. And it's the same thing I think that the Democrats are doing or with, with for the, the, the legal fees of, of clearly the mayor was, was operating in a very difficult time for our city. The, you know, the streets were closed with protests. Uh, you, you, I mean, you were involved with this, Robin. This was a stressful, very difficult time. 
it was not about oppression. It was about trying to keep the city running. And this is ridiculous that they are they are kind of keeping this going with this negative energy. So we've got a comment here from John Kaufman, who writes the Saratoga Springs politics blog, who says this should not have been tabled. It is really straightforward. And I mean, to me, and then he actually says this feels like the ghost of Ron Kim. It really does feel like the ghost of Ron Kim, because I don't know if you guys remember, but Ron Kim would constantly bring up legal fees and and he completely made up a legal bill that I had. I mean, he he loved to harp on this issue. Um, it does seem like it should have been discussed last night and cleared up pretty quickly. Um, again, anyone who is an attorney or who has a background, a legal background like the city attorneys have, I feel like they should have been able to hash it out with what the charter says versus what this, you know, attorney said in the letter, but, 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 but it should have been quick. It should have been voted on last night. Um, I don't like it when, you know, the commissioners and start playing politics at the table. You know, if they, if someone had an issue, they should have brought it up in pre-agenda. They could have had it figured out by Tuesday night. Um, so I always feel like it's a little bit disingenuous when you have other commissioners bring up objections that they haven't brought up the day before. It just feels like, again, playing politics as opposed to getting city business done and moving things forward. I let me comment on that. I, I somewhat disagree with you, with you and John Kaufman in that I wish the city council would use the motion to table a little more often. And you're right, Robin, probably the best course of action would have been to go into executive session. But the motion to table to to talk it over to, to buy some time to talk it over and again everything you said is valid i they should have you know at, at pre-agenda they should that they should have been hashed out but it wasn't so there you are with a uh a, 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 something that the city is required to to do yet it, it didn't know where the vote was going to go right it, it just didn't know and obviously executive session would have done that but i'd like to see uh the motion to table done more often for instance when the van dam issue was voted on in december only to have state DOT say what, what you voted right. on was illegal. That would have been a great time to do a motion. Let's think this through. And there were a lot of people there vehement that night from Van Dam. My heart goes out to them. But that doesn't mean we should r rush uh, rush things through that end up we getting egg on our face a month later that says you, that was totally illegal. And you, and we look foolish. We look like we shot you know the gang that couldn't shoot straight. So I would like to see the motion to the table used a little more often. Maybe not the best method, but... Uh, I still think a prudent uh, 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 action by Commissioner Gold. But not as like a political maneuver, which I think was how it was being used last night. Like, I agree with you. There are certain issues that I fully think should have been tabled or should have been pushed out to the following meeting before they were voted on because they need to be discussed. Public feedback needs to be taken into consideration. There's missing information that needs to be gathered, you know, for actual to make sure the resolution holds up as it's voted on. But you know, in this instance, I think that wasn't necessarily the case. I think it was really a political maneuver, but, um, you know, what are you going to do? Um, let's see. We have another comment from John Kaufman who says, good point by Dan and Jason argued to put off the Van Dam thing, but this issue, unlike the Van Dam thing, was clear. So there you have it from Mr. Kaufman. Um, at any rate, um, there weren't a whole ton of other substantive items on the agenda last night. Um, there were some really nice proclamations that were made specifically to two high school students who were basically in like a car accident, who were not injured in the car accident and ran out and helped the other victim of the car accident and really contributed to the other victim surviving and, and recovering. And so they had a really nice proclamation for those two high school students that it, that was like very heartwarming and, and, and kind and sweet. Um, Robert, I, I'd like to go back to David Buchan, Buchan, I always say his name wrong. His comments <laughs> against participatory budgeting, it was it was clearly bullseye. He essentially said from what I heard, heard and I heard the whole thing was it's bad. Like it's it even said it's illegal because you're you're it's an unelected group that's and I, I thought, holy cow, um uh, he said, ah, you're you're celebrating an elementary school kids, can't the well-funded school. I, I, Mr. Bushin, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I think we only met once, so I'm not attacking you, but I, I just think you were off base. I'm a fan of participatory budgeting. My goodness, he even criticized uh, curling. He said, and he misspoke though. He said, we built a curling facility. We did not. We took an ice rink that's been here for decades and uh, for two hours a, a month, uh, dedicated, or you know, a few more hours a month dedicated it to curling. But uh, okay. so it, it was odd to hear that. Uh, but I kind of disagree though. 
I disagree, Dan. I got to disagree with you on this one because all we've been hearing from the city council for the last couple of months is belly aching over money that we have to come up with new revenue sources, new revenue sources, new revenue sources. We have to cover a homeless shelter. We have to cover the third fire station. We've got all these huge expenses and we need more revenue to come in. And so in the, that context, when you put aside $100,000 every year for participatory budgeting, and you're specifically using them for things like a dog water fountain for our farmer's market that is very expensive and very fancy and very, you know, first world, if I may say. Um, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of inherent kind of conflict there. There's a, uh, I don't know. They they don't really go hand in hand. You know, the city council talking about how they need new revenue. And then on the flip side, we have this participatory budgeting program happening. Not saying I'm against participatory budgeting. I'm just saying there's um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's uh, there's just In, some inconsistency or a disconnect or something. Or... Yeah. 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 But hey, let me, let me, they spent forty thousand dollars on flowers last night. The city, you know, there's a there's some quality of life things that this, this city addresses, and I'm glad they do. It's part of what makes us a wonderful city. I'm happy they're spending money on flowers. Congress Park coming down Union Avenue in the summer. That's why people come back right. here. They escape right. from their urban jungle and come to this oasis. So, sorry, Adam, go ahead. I was going to say, let me split split the middle here with you. Dave Buchan, head of the Conservative Party, clearly fiscal conservative. I agree with. With his, his saying, listen, if you want to go after the commissioner of finance for, for spending money, you know, look at the, the new office she did or look at hiring a personal assistant. I'd like to see him go after those. But I, I, I'm with you, Dan, on the participatory budgeting thing. I think it's a fun program that the commissioner in enacted. Uh, and I do. I think it's one of these things that makes our, our, our city special. So I'm kind of going to split in the middle. I agree with David. There's, there's ways we should be saving money. That's not one of them. I like that. I mean, it just gave me the warm and fuzzies, the participatory budgeting. And Lake Avenue Elementary, where all my kids go, was the, is the recipient of $10,000 from that participatory budgeting. And I'm delighted about it. So, you know, I don't mean to argue both sides here. I just think, like, the context, I can. there's some cognitive dissonance. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it is a wealthy school. It is a wealthy district. And I'm, I'm an alum of Lake Ave, too. It was not a wealthy school when I went there. It's <laughs> The well, the Centennial is Celebration is going to be amazing, everyone. Lake Avenue Elementary Centennial Celebration for Saturday in May, FYI. Um, I want to move on, if it's all right with you guys, because we have a guest here joining us to talk about short-term rentals. And I'd love to bring him in, if that's all right with you two. Absolutely. All right. Jeffrey, hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Ian, can you give us a little background on Jeffrey and why he's so valuable to this conversation we've been having in the city about short-term uh, rental? Sure. And Jeff, just so you know who you're speaking to, you and I have spoke. Mm -hmm. um, Robin is a past public safety commissioner here in Saratoga Springs. Um, Adam's a lifetime resident. Uh, he has run for public office here. Um, I'm a gadfly with a website. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we uh, the three of us came together a couple of years ago. We're almost at 100 episodes, and we we love this city, and so we podcast usually about the politics, sometimes about the economic development, and sometimes about the fun things about this city. So that's what brings us here. So thank you again for for joining us. So folks, uh, Planner Jeffrey Goodman, he's a, a short-term rental policy expert and planning consultant. Um, he's worked for a number of municipalities, not only in New York but across the nation, and I believe even uh, internationally, mm -hmm. uh, locally, or at least upstate, he's done work uh, most recently for the city of Ithaca. Uh, Mr. Goodman, uh, welcome here to, to the Saratoga podcast. Yeah, it's it's great to be here. Uh, I'm in New Orleans, uh, which is a very interesting place, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you will get some uh, real springtime weather here. We're, we've already passed into summer, uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully it's nice up there. Uh, yeah, we've been, we're getting great, great weather this week anyway, and we've had a, a decent winter, a mild winter and so forth. So and okay. summer's coming, summer's coming <laughs> and, uh, yes. uh, where the, the Belmont Stakes is coming to Saratoga mm -hmm. this year, which is uh, historical. It's never happened here, here before. So that's uh, quite the buzz. And it, it is, have a short, it certainly has a short term rental nexus. So I'm let sure. me, let me set the table real quick where Saratoga Springs is Robin and Adam, if I get it wrong, please uh, jump in. But, uh, a few months ago, the city put out a proposal to regulate short-term rentals, which mm -hmm. other than some old laws before Airbnb, but it's been an issue here for, because people rent sure. out their house for track season since the 1800s. Um, but they, they put out an, what I would describe as an aggressive 
proposal, uh, pretty expensive, $1,000 every two years to register a number of uh, other facets of it that quickly created an organized and funded opposition to it. And now the city is waiting to see what state legislation, any hour now, really, with the state budget, there will be state legislation uh, to some degree regulating short-term rental, not guaranteed, but that's expected anyway, um, uh, that will happen. And that will give an option, that will likely give an option to municipalities to uh, uh, to do their own short-term rental regulations or default to the state. Yeah. So the city is very close to putting out a 2.0 version of their uh, previous proposal that will probably be markedly different from their original proposal. Mm-hmm. How and where it'll change, I don't think we know. A- Adam or Robin, I don't think we know too much other than what I've heard through the grapevine of mm-hmm. what this new version will be. So I can't give you specifics. Mm-hmm. But you, knowing your history and your background and your knowledge, if you were simply to get on a really long elevator ride and, <laughs> and, and, Empire State Bill, and you had some time to talk to uh, uh, the city council or or a bunch of citizens, what what general advice or what overall intro would you tell people? Because we're heading down a path the city's never head down before, and you've seen plenty, plenty of other municipalities that have. Oh, yeah, I've seen pretty much everything. I've seen, uh, you know, places that go and and ban it. I've seen places that go and say, as long as you pay your taxes, we don't care what you do. Uh, I've seen pretty much every direction you can go. You know, the the ways that this discussion goes off the rails very quickly is people jump immediately to the details. They want to know, is it two bedrooms or three bedrooms? Is it R1 zones or R1B zones? And there's so many different ways to go. There's so many different levers you can you can pull uh, in regulation. What I always tell places is take a moment and everyone think about what is your goal? What are the priorities that you're going to look at? How is this issue going to slot into bigger values, bigger documents, bigger things that are going on in your town? Because then that gives you a way to say this idea, while good and while you know, another city did that, that's not really working towards the goal that we have set here as a community. And lots of places have housing goals, lots of places have economic development goals, lots of places just have kind of quality of life goals. Some places just say we want ease of enforcement, whatever it is, uh, that's going to be the way that you sort of choose things uh, when the rubber meets the road, when you have to prioritize, when you have to make a decision of what it's going to be. You need to be able to justify those choices through through some broader goal, through some other values, through something that's coming in. That's a huge, huge step, and that's a step a lot of communities, especially smaller communities, skip <laughs> because they everyone has their has their opinion. Uh, you know, all the hosts obviously want to legalize whatever it is they do and nothing else. Uh, neighbors aren't usually in favor, so they want stricter controls. But it's often based entirely off of what's happened to them and not really a town-wide picture or a region-wide picture. So being able to express those goals and for people to be honest about them uh, and and be able to pull from other documents, whether it's your master plan, whether that's your housing needs assessment, whether it's an economic development assessment or a tourism assessment, being able to pull from those things and establish a goal and and answer what I, I know sounds like a kind of silly question, but is actually a really important one, which is three years from now, five years now, one year from now, how will you know you've succeeded in this ordinance? Yeah. Is it <laughs> tax revenues up? Is it houses are back on the market, the long-term market? Is it we don't get any calls for complaints because the hosts handle everything? How will you know? How will you know it, it actually succeeded? So having that in mind, being able to, to art, you know, articulate that and debate it on that level rather than immediately you know, how much parking something needs, Right. Uh, I think we'll just allow you to <laughs> to frame the debate and be able to to make good choices uh, and justify those choices um, in a in a whole ordinance. Uh, places that don't do that, you just get stuck in a swamp. You're just discussing every possible option, and there's no way to choose. There's no way to make a an informed choice about what you actually want to want to do. So that that is number one at the top. Um, and and people often have that implicit, but you. I, I think it's useful to, to come out and say it or, or for the city to come out and say it or the council members to come out and say, I'm in my view, <laughs> X is the number one thing we got to we got to solve for. Yeah. Jeffrey, we could have used you a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we went out this completely backwards. Everybody's yelling. 
you know, like you said, the biggest thing was the 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 registration fee, mm-hmm. right? Like, and you couldn't get any more detail than that. That was our biggest the biggest argument. And that's actually really simple. I mean, what you can do, obviously, you can look at other other towns and see what what they do. We have a, a rule of thumb uh, when we have short term rental data to work with, which is uh, roughly three times the nightly average. So we say one long weekend a year is for the government, and the rest is for you. Um, you know, three times the nightly average is usually in the realm. I think most places these days, it's 400 to 500. If you have a place like yours where maybe there's some more special events or a higher end clientele, maybe that goes higher. I mean, Atlantic City, I think it's 1800. Uh, you can... Let's go into Atlantic City. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, anymore. I mean... 19-year-old huh. me. <laughs> 20 19-year-olds probably going into a, into a house there and they just split it, but... You know, I think they, our commissioner here, Mr. Goodman, uh, Commissioner Moran, is doing a touchdown dance right now because he proposed five hundred dollars a year, which was roughly equivalent to one rental night here. Yep. And you're, you're you're saying, and he was criticized by uh, Plenty Four, probably myself. Uh, so let me acknowledge, Commissioner Moran, if you're watching, uh, you you were in the ballpark. You well, still well, may have to lower it. Let's throw out a little a little thing yeah. of why that doesn't work for our city, though, because mm-hmm. our city, if you had to take six weekends out of the year, seven yep. if you're including Belmonts. Where that that long weekend is going to be four to five, it's exponentially higher. Let's just say mm-hmm. than True. a weekend not in the in that time frame. So that that's a tough. That's a you got to choose right. And and like I said, it's just going to be based on your context, right? We work with, you know, summering destinations in New England. Well, if you look at it in November, you're going to come up with a very different number than you could you look at it in yeah. in July. So you know you want to find a place where the amount of money you're bringing in is going to pay for enforcement and everyone wants good enforcement enforcement costs money so you have to you know be okay with with that uh but you don't necessarily want it to be so extreme that you know you're really providing some huge burden onto people i will say another thing that places do is they do get even more nuanced with something as simple as a fee so in places that have a primary residency requirement. This is your actual home, you live there, but maybe you're gone those weeks because you know you can make some money, fine. Or you're a snowbird or something. You know, your your fee is lower than, this is a non-primary resident, this is just, is just a short-term rental that exists for those six or seven weekends a year or just for the summer. They often pay a higher fee. Maybe they're located in different areas. Maybe there's a cap on them. You know, that's where you can choose how to be very nuanced really put you know the um the appropriate levels of of responsibilities on different types of hosts you know we talk about short-term rentals there's a lot of different types of users and uses you know there's the little old lady (laughs) renting out her couch who may or may not exist but maybe does all the way to you know people who are running essentially distributed hotels right you were talking tens or 20 properties they're, they may not all have the same values. They may not have all the same uh, interests in how the regulation actually works. But oftentimes, especially in, in, in smaller places, they're treated as a monolith. Well, the guy who, the, in, the real estate investment trust based in Manhattan that owns 30 properties and the little old lady who's going to rent out her house for one weekend for the Belmont, they maybe don't have that much in, in common. And so that's where you can start to use the categorization, you know, the differentiation within that, what we call short-term rentals to be really nuanced and to, again, sort of <laughs> make sure that your regulations reflect the the type of industry you see on the ground. Can I, can I quickly just go back to your first point? Because I think it really sums up like why we're kind of in swampy waters here. <laughs> yeah. And I know swamps. It's Louisiana. We know swamps. Yeah. <laughs> well, initially, this conversation about short-term rentals um, started over the issue of occupancy tax mm-hmm. and the fact that hotels and, um, you know, uh, the inns, Everything but short-term rentals, basically. Correct. Right. Are paying occupancy tax. And so this, so putting an occupancy tax on short-term rentals would level the playing field and everyone mm-hmm. would be paying their fair share. So that was kind of how it started. But then it became about safety and mm-hmm. making sure that everyone was had inspections and you know um they were had enough you know egress and bedrooms for what they were zoned for and how many people were staying there and so forth sure and then and then it just kind of devolved from there <laughs> yeah. and so i am personally unclear as to what our goal is as a city and i don't know how we would come up with that metric 
that you were kind of talking about, like a year from now or two years from now, how are we going to determine if this is successful? Yeah. And so to me, that's been the biggest problem in terms of how we're, we've been handling this discussion. Yeah, I often say that there's kind of three pieces. So developing that lens that you would use to, to think about how you, you, you regulate, sometimes those things are drawn, like I said, from documents that you already worked through, a, a master plan, right? You can often point and say, we worked through that. There's that whole statement at the beginning of this document that most of you did not read that says, these are the values of the community. This is what we're working towards, right? So you can often pull from those and say, we already agreed to that. Like, let's work through this issue using using that thing that we already spent all this time on. But the other way to do it would be really kind of three inputs. And uh, I went to design school, so everything's a shape, so I'm a little triangle. Uh, on one side, you have data, right? So what is the scope and scale of the short-term rental uh, industry? Who's participating in it? What type of properties are they? When are they doing it? How much are they charging? Uh, do you have huge changes year to year? Or is it a steady growth? Is it on the decline? Who knows? Um, that's the short-term rental side. There's also the long-term rental or the the you know house price side. You know, how does this interact with the availability, the affordability of long-term rentals is often a big concern, especially in, in locations like yours. So getting some sense, and often we even hear from business owners who say, I can't find people to work in our shops because they are they have to live 45 minutes away because there's no homes for them anymore here. Or even in some places, we can't hire teachers, we can't find a veterinarian, like people just can't afford to live here. So we, we want to get into that. So that's on the data side. The other piece is on the on the ground. Uh, I'm sure you guys have have heard or experienced that, which is what is it like for an individual person, you know, as a as a host, as a guest, and as a neighbor, right? Are people all just really frustrated because there's there's trash and noise? Is it people have stayed in these things and they're not that safe? Are hosts complaining because they just want some clarity? You know, you want to get the that kind of sort of a personal. Uh, touch to things, because that's also in some ways how it's going to be judged. If people don't feel it on the ground, they're not going to believe that you did anything or did it right. Uh, and then that third piece is is really sort of government knowledge, right? The individual person doesn't have a great appreciation for <laughs> what's constitutional, what the state allows you to do, what the budget of the, the city is, how many people do you have to do X, Y, and Z. What are the long-term goals? What are the citywide goals? That's where you do need a lot of, <laughs> of, you know, a, a, often a heavier hand than a lot of public servants like to to get into. And I, I speak as like you know more as a, a planner, someone in, on staff. Uh, we try to be very even-handed, but sometimes you need to say like <laughs> that's not legal, or okay, but we would have to hire five people. That's going to cost money you know, to have that level of, of care, what other things do we need to do that an individual would not would not appreciate and you wouldn't expect them to, to appreciate as, as a member of the public. If you have those three pieces and you can get everyone on the same page, even with just terminology, if I say a whole home rental, people have a lot of different ideas of what that wow. definitionally means. So sometimes, I mean, you make a vocab sheet, you know, elementary school style, style will do it, but if you have those pieces together, then I think you can have a conversation and it makes the more extreme voices uh, slightly more marginalized because they seem more extreme because you framed it as, okay, we can work through this. We have an idea of, of the scope of the issue. We hear what you're saying, but also we need to work within the framework of, of government and, and figure out a way to enforce it. So that is... I love this triangle. So yeah. I love a triangle. Everyone loves a triangle. <laughs> But often places just kind of skip one of those or, or they don't have the data. So you have people come in and say like short-term rentals are causing every problem in our city. It's the reason I got a flat tire. It's the reason my wife left me, like all that. And you're like, <laughs> well, it's some something. It's something. But, you know, we can look and get get the data and get the, get a map or get just some idea of really what we're talking about, especially when we talk about housing. So, yeah, it it's useful to, <laughs> to have all those pieces and to get everyone on the same page. You know, I always say that the, the goal isn't to get everyone to agree, because if that's your goal in local government, you're in the wrong business. That's just not going to happen. The goal is that at the end of the day, everyone understands why the rules are the way they are. Now, they might disagree with it. Some of them will definitely disagree with it. But they'll at least understand why it is you've chosen the things that you're chosen, why you're doing the program that you're doing. And if they don't like it and they don't like it enough, 
you know, in a couple of years, they can run for city council, they can run for mayor, and they can justify why they would go in a different direction. Um, that's what? that's well, the goal. That's... People applauding that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I can interject with a question for you, I, I as a as a citizen here, I'm concerned that um, perhaps they sought outside help and they 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 got it from an outside municipal law firm or mm -hmm. someone like yourself. But as far as I know, and Admiral Robin, correct me if I'm wrong. I, it seems like everything that's been fashioned so far was done in-house with without any outside help. And I realize I may be putting you in an awkward position to kind of promote, <laughs> you, not you, but the you know the 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 industry of those a, a new industry perhaps of those that help municipalities out. But I'm worried about a lawsuit. I'm worried about injunctions. I'm worried about lingering negativity. Because sure. in two or three years, you say, "My God, we're still fighting over this." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how does a city proactively now? Mm -hmm. Avoid that, and what role does does hiring uh, uh, experienced outside people uh, play in that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I've been brought into a lot of different kinds of situations. Some that are very tense. Some that people will say this isn't an issue, but we don't want to deal with it, or we can't deal with it because we don't have the time, and everything in between. You know, I I always and and I came from affordable housing. That was my my planning background before I I sort of focused on this issue. And for me, at least in my own sort of code of ethics, is I, I'm not Moses on the mountaintop. I'm not going to come down and, and bring you something set in stone and go deal with it and then shed away with your money. That's not how I like to do things. I do want things to be based in the community and based in local values and, and to, you know, I can help guide that conversation. I can help frame that conversation. I can tell you what other cities have done and what the results of those are. That may not be true in your community, right? You're obviously very different than a, than so many other cities. You know what works in in San Francisco isn't going to just work the same way where you are. So, you know, we often are brought in by by cities who um, either want uh, outside help because it helps them understand what other places are doing and what other types of of positive and negatives have come. Also, sometimes they just want someone different to get yelled at, and that's okay too. Um, and, and often being an outsider, I'm able to say things that a public servant would not, right? If I'm at a public meeting and someone tells me something that's that's real jive, I will just say, I don't think that's true or, or we don't have the data to support that or that would be uh, disastrous or that would lead to lawsuits or all these things that the planning director, you know, is, is trained not to say because that is not good public service in a lot of cases to be so com not combative, but just to really push back when people give the, give those types of comments. So sometimes I play that role. Sometimes I get to be a little, a little mean and a little grumpy uh, when necessary, uh, which is not an option often for local governments, but also sometimes my position as an outsider means that I'm, I'm trusted, right? So everyone believes that there's a, there's a fix in, right? Um, and so being an outsider, sometimes that that makes it easier for me to to navigate different people because I don't have their their histories. I don't have their, you know, beefs that go back to some project five years ago or 10 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever it is. So, um, uh, yeah. And then especially out west, a lot of times we're engaged just because they just don't have the people. You know, right. we talked to, to Missoula, Montana. They <laughs> they they were just we, we have every single person working 10 hour shifts doing building permits. We don't have the people to sit here and, and really study it. So it's every kind of every kind of situation for sure. We have a quick comment here um, from Dina, who I know has followed this issue and said the city paid $10,000 to the town law firm after they were awarded a contract for $5,000 to draft an ordinance. Um, I also believe that. Thank you, Dina. I did not know that. In yeah. all fairness, I don't know how experienced a town law firm is in that. Maybe they are. I don't know. Well, I also know that they, I think, have been consulting with this company, Granicus. I, th I think. Yeah. But, um, so that's but a company I also consult for. Um, so Granicus is a is a government software company. And one of their uh, suites is about short-term rental enforcement. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening a lot of time is they either work with me or work with other firms or just keep an eye out. Uh, you know, you can't sell enforcement software to a place that doesn't have an ordinance. Uh, right. right. So they're always on the, the lookout and looking to partner with places uh, that are adopting ordinances to give them the tools to then be able to to drive compliance or to begin that 
to begin enforcement um, in a more sort of systematized manner. So that's that's they're they're the biggest sort of operator in that in that um, technology niche. Uh, there are a couple other other companies, um, but that is that's who does a lot of the kind of online monitoring of the uh, short-term rental um, listing sites. Yeah. Now, I think I read correctly that you consulted with Ithaca. Was that correct? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I'm also right now working with Ellicottville uh, on their ordinance um, and a few other places in the nor Northeast. I, again, I work at a very different scale sometimes. Sometimes it's just kind of consulting where I'm marking up a, a document. Sometimes it's I'm getting I'm getting yelled at in a middle school gym. So we have all sorts of things going on. Yeah. Ithaca is often um, one of the cities that people compare to Saratoga Springs, although Saratogians like to think that there's no city like Saratoga absolutely, Springs absolutely in the not universe. Right. You know, we're <laughs> right. special. But um, I went to Cornell. I spent four years in Ithaca. And I will say there's a lot of, you know, comparable mm -hmm. uh, things between the two cities. C could you give us a little insight into your experience there and what the outcome of their short-term rental regulation discussion was? I'm just kind of <laughs> Yeah. So they're, they're working through it, I believe, uh, you know, especially they have, they have the student population. They have some housing goals that they have, they have foregrounded a little bit more than um, some other places in, in New York state that, that I've talked to uh, just because they, one, that's sort of the Ithaca vibe. And two, yeah. they have the um, a, a population like a student population um, or even some of the grad student population or some of the professor's population where they don't have a lot of money and they don't have a lot of choice. They kind of need to live near near the university. Um, and so they want to, I think, try to protect that, that specific type of housing typology. Um, they worry a little bit about... Um, you know, <laughs> what's happened in a lot of other college towns where uh, there's a lot of money to be made. Either rich alums buy homes and they use them a couple times the year and then they, they rent them out for parents weekend and for graduation. Uh, or, you know, just that there's kinds of pressures on their lodging industry that they want to shape in a, in a more sort of uh, direct way because they don't want short-term rentals to compete with bed and breakfast or with hotels one because they're better regulated and two because they they make more money for the for the city so um i think they're just trying to work through it there's a whole side of of what they're looking to that are more operational requirements what does it mean to be a host uh you know how many people can you have what sort of um inspection regime is there going to be uh if you know do you have a local contact person what's the trash situation i mean some some of that is just working through and then they also you know, a big point of emphasis was on enforcement. You know, how do we shape this enforcement so that we drive um, compliance? We don't have this as kind of a lingering uh, gray area where people are trying to to get away with things. And that's been pretty constant, no matter how they've adjusted some of those definitions. They, they looked at primary residency as well. They, they wanted a bunch of um, examples of primary residency from uh, New York, from cities in New York state. So we were able to, to write a lot of those. Yeah. And Robin, if I could just mention, I've been talking to the planning department in Ithaca. That's how uh, I found Mr. Goodman. And the city council there will be voting on a proposal on May 1st. So they yet don't have one either. But they are, uh, I believe, ahead of Saratoga in the process. And uh, I believe May 1st is when they're planning on, uh, at least it will be on the agenda. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and I can get you the link. Uh, that you could post on Saratoga, uh, uh, the podcast. Uh, yeah, we'll, put it, we'll drop in comments. That, that that has their proposed policy. Yeah. Because for those who don't know, I, I find it's going to be so interesting as a city because they're actually like way more progressive than we are. Mm -hmm. um, their city council is very progressive. I mean, when I was going to school there, they were introducing like a local currency. They're, they're very progressive. <laughs> yeah. And it's an, it's a really interesting juxtaposition between the university and the city leadership. Um, but uh, I think it offers some interesting insight into what they're doing versus what's happening here. Um, and the primary residency issue, um, I feel like is a big part of the conversation here. Wouldn't you agree, Dan and Adam? Um, people who are primary residents. Yeah, and, and, and rightfully so, because you know one of the unique parts about Saratoga is we do have a history, like Dan alluded to, going back over a hundred years of people renting out their homes for the track season. Sure. And as the industries change, I mean, it's, it's, it's fundamentally the same thing, 
but the industry and, and the ease of doing that has changed it now. And, and now that you have, it was never lucrative enough or ever enough where people would, we had outside investment firms mm-hmm. coming in and, and buying up homes. You have that now. So yep. all these yep. issues you touched on with home prices, affordability of living here, and, and then all the, you know, that leads to the staffing issues. We're, Saratoga is facing that. And, mm-hmm. and so it is a lot of complex issues. And I think you're, you know, I, th- I think you're absolutely right with, you know, it looks like Saratoga paid for write an ordinance. How do you write an ordinance when you don't have a, a broad view of what that ordinance should entail? And I think maybe, maybe that's what we did a little bit is put the car before the horse and, that, and come up with, all right, what are our goals? And I think, I think you touched on our goals. Our goals are for the affordable housing. You know, our goals are for regulation. Our goals are to keep the, the our, our neighborhoods uh, clean and safe and, mm-hmm. and you know, not absentee party houses, landlord party houses next to you. So these are all the, you know, right there, there's my triangle, the three things I'd like to see <laughs> in a year. Uh, but but without losing this this part of our, our social fabric that's been here for, for a century. Yeah, I will say that, you know, around housing, something that, that I think has been very exciting. There were, there've been waves of different sort of general uh uh, forms of short-term rental regulation. There was a very early adopter cities that said, it's the internet, we're going to be on board. And then they've had to rewrite their ordinances about five different times, um, you know, Portland or San Francisco. There was a wave of just people being like, please just register and pay your taxes. Like we just need any kind of of handle on what's going on. Um, and now we're getting to a place where where places are just, I think, a little savvier about taking this as a housing issue, if they want to take it as a housing issue. But even beyond that, and this is driven largely by places in, say, Colorado, which have extreme housing markets, uh, very limited building space, huge short-term rental demand, but also, like, need people to work there, to do anything. We've seen some places start to, to get a little creative about that and recognizing that they do have this very high demand for uh for tourism and for lodging that they don't have to work very hard on they they have it they don't have to promote they barely have to promote it people will come there you know how is there a way to um leverage that to create affordable housing opportunities we've seen some places uh do direct subsidies we've seen some places say you know you could build an adu and that adu can be short-term rented for three years and then become must become affordable housing We've seen places treat short-term rentals as kind of a development bonus, right? And uh, where, you know, you could build higher or denser and have a short-term rental if you also have an affordable unit. Uh, There's all sorts of interesting ways, and obviously not all of them fit for the built environment. Some of them fit with New York State law, especially with the the new new housing laws that are coming in. But just I think these things don't always have to be necessarily in opposition, but you just have to be careful and, and considerate about how do we take these real assets and make sure that we're working for, you know, this broader this broader vision and this broader goal? So um, that's really exciting to see. It's exciting to, for me to be able to to look at places like Taos County, New Mexico, and Aspen, and 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 all these places that are looking at ways to <laughs> to not have just housing and short term rentals be this battle but actually ways to produce and, and create new things. So that that's for me exciting as a as a very as a real nerd about planning. But even <laughs> even if you don't go down that route, like there are just a lot of simple things primary residence being one of them that I think can put a little bit of a break on um on those big sh- you know swings in um in the housing market. I will say local governments don't have control over housing actually very much at all. You don't control the interest rates. You don't control the price of insurance. You don't control the price of roofing materials. Short-term rentals are a piece of of your housing market that you do actually have a lot of local control over in terms of where they exist, how many exist, what are they doing, who's doing them. Uh, And I think it does sort of behoove local government to use that power um, if they want to. Uh, to shape that market because so much of the uh, the rest of the housing market is really really difficult to um, to influence on a local level even well, even if you have Ithaca bucks even if you do everything <laughs> Ithaca right. bucks yeah um, well I this part of uh, the kind of how this has played out here that's really killed me is that in 2019 and um, 2020 we passed a unified development ordinance which is mm-hmm. this master plan document that took like years and years for the city <laughs> to develop. And I was like, why are we not including short-term rentals in this discussion and in this document? And for whatever reason, 
you know, I was a newbie and they, it was like a, nope, nope, it's not going to be touched on here. And I was yeah. like, it just felt like, it feels like such a huge missed opportunity to not have had that discussion when we were developing that UDO. Um, because as you said, they, they don't have to be in opposition. They can actually, you know, work in tandem successfully. Um, so that just irritates me, you know, <laughs> we should have done it. We should have sure. done it um, when we were passing the UDO, but um, I, we are coming up on an hour and I want to thank you, Jeffrey, for being so generous with your time and your insight today. I know yeah, it's, absolutely. it helps me kind of tackle this issue, um, a lot better. Um, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, no Real problem. Quick, if, you want, if you want to throw in a shameless plug now, what, what is, what's your business? What, what, what's your... <laughs> yes. How can people hire you? Tell us. Well, uh, you can hire me through Granicus. <laughs> uh, Granicus has all my information. I think I technically have a Granicus email. Uh, it's uh, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y uh, dot Goodman, G-O-O-D-M-A-N at Granicus.com, G-R-A-N-I-C-U-S dot com. Uh, I also sort of run consulting uh, separate from that, but that that's probably the easiest and, and most direct way to reach me. I also have an urban planning themed Mardi Gras crew if anyone wants to come down to New Orleans next year and... and Love a good zoning pun. Amazing. Uh, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a man of many talents. Uh, but yeah, that is that is probably the best way to reach me is that that email, and, and we can talk about if, what you're interested in doing. If, if well, you work in Saratoga, you have to come here because I want to come to the school gym and yell at you. I, I want mean, my money's worth. I've had meetings where people I go my I do my little spiel, and then the first public comment is a guy with a 12 inch Bowie knife on his on his hip saying, "Why are you here?" So. <laughs> You're gonna, have to, be, your you're gonna have to beat that. that. You're gonna have to beat I, that. I want to work on your like planning and zoning and uh, themed Mardi Gras situation. That sounds like a <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I'd, yeah, I'd you'd be amazed that. how many how many uh, planning puns you can come up with. I, I didn't think it was. I thought I would have like you know two years <laughs> worth, and now we're on year uh, nine. So That's for our next episode, we're gonna go through. We'll all talk the about that. Puns. That'll be good. Yeah, totally, yeah, good. absolutely. <laughs> Thank um, you so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yep. Take care. Very Bye -bye. That was great, Th Dan. Thank you so much for connecting us with him. That was fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed him, him being here. I enjoyed the insight he, he gave. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I wish, I don't know how involved Granicus is in the planning, uh, since he is part of Granicus. And I wrote a letter, I wrote an email to city council last night saying they should hire somebody like Jeffrey Goodman, uh, uh, to guide us through this. Cause I still think that we're, there's not enough outside, uh, help on, on this matter. You know, it's hard to tell. So Dina uh, commented again, saying 56,000 was sold to a city with no ordinance. Dina, I'm wondering if that is what we're paying to Granicus. I'm wondering if you could give us a little more context to that um, 56,000. But I'm wondering if this is more of a, I want to take political credit for this. So I'm not going to talk about the company we've been consulting with to put this together, if that's kind of the situation. And yeah, maybe that's a misstep because talking about you know, when you hear from someone like Jeffrey and his expertise, it's like, holy cow, how could we even have this conversation without having that resource on board? And it would give people more confidence in how the legislation was designed and why we came up with it. And it would just, I think it would explain and give people a little more confidence in the, in the resolution itself. Ithaca had a, a very much more public, uh, the, the, the knowledge, the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The disclosure, the uh, uh, transparency. Uh, oh, along the way. You, yeah. Right now we're sort of in the dark because the old one's going to be partially thrown out, you know, mostly right. thrown out. I don't know, but we're largely in the dark until we see. Right, the as one. a born and raised Saratogian, if you two love Ithaca so much, why don't you guys just move there? I mean, I'm it's sick of hearing about how great Ithaca is and their bucks and their planning and, and their progressiveness. I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure, that, I'm, sure <laughs> I'm sure they have an awesome amphitheater. You go listen to bands there. Oh, yeah, come on now. I didn't say I loved how That's my gear for the day. I'm sure the horse <laughs> racing is uh, tremendous too. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, guys, we are now over an hour. Should we wrap up and do our cheers and jeers? Sure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, what do you guys have for me? I'll go last. Okay, I'll, I'll kick off if you guys are okay with it. Yeah, go for it. Um, my cheer. Um, and I've criticized this current city council, certainly criticized the last city council. But right now we have a functioning city council. I think it's functional. 
They ended their meeting at 8.56 p.m. last night. Good for you, Mayor Safford and, and the other four people. And, yeah, there's there's dissension and debate and so forth, but there's there's also comedy, you know, to, to, with a T. You know, they're, they're getting along. They're, they're, they're doing things. They're moving things along. And, again, go back to parking. There were a lot of uh, – um, uh, negative feelings towards it, you know, some people, it, it, and they did what they thought was right. I, I give Commissioner Gold credit, even though I criticize certain aspects of it, even if I don't like some of that plan, even if I'm uh, 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 suspicious or not suspicious, skeptical of how well it'll work if we'll bring in the money. We have a functional city council that has some shortcomings, and I'm concerned about them, you know, So, but we're, we're sort of dealing with the the, the last city council, which some of the members are carryovers, but uh, two people, and I'm not giving necessary credit to, to, to Mayor Safford and Tim Cole, but it's a change dynamic. They're all uh, looking better, I guess. That's my cheer. We have a functioning city council. A jeer. Uh, really sad news, right? There were two police officers killed in Syracuse area earlier this week, a, dep a sheriff's deputy and a city police officer in a shooting. Um, nonsensical. Of course, they're all nonsensical. And then just last night, uh, a uh, Albany police officer was shot. Thankfully, he survived. I don't know I don't know his, uh, his prognosis, but uh, as of my last reading an hour or two ago, he, he, he had survived. Um, my God, what is happening? Upstate, you know, two, the three police officers shot, two killed within, uh, you know, maybe 72 hours. That's, that's horrible. I'm, I'm, I'm terribly saddened by that. We just had a quick comment from, um, Tipton, Mary, Mary Tipton, who said, I bought a shirt, shirt to support these families. I believe she's referring to Barstool Sports, which, mm -hmm. um, raised like a million and a half dollars for a police officer in New York city who was killed and is now doing the same thing for these two officers upstate. Um, and so if you go to Barstool Sports, you can buy a T-shirt. The money goes to the families who are affected. And I believe there's a, like a matching donation by Dave Portnoy involved. So he, um, he, he had a comment saying, you know, I spent a lot of my time in Saratoga. So if it happens in upstate, that's part of my home. I want to yeah. help out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, my cheers are really superficial sounding. I got to <laughs> in contrast. Um my cheer is for my, <laughs> this sounds so ridiculous coming off the heels of this conversation, my favorite new snack item, which is freeze-dried candy made by Stella, who is a, I believe she lives in Balsam Spa. She's a teenager. She started her own company and it's this freeze-dried candy. I've been obsessed with freeze-dried candy forever. And now it's becoming like popular, you know, on social media and so forth. And it's sold at um, Franklin Square Market and it's sold at Impressions and it's so freaking good. And it's made by a local teenager. So go out, grab yourself some Stella's freeze dried candy and enjoy. It's a delight. Um, I got to interrupt you. I think I bought some and Robin, it's not, you know, it's a young entrepreneur in our area. I think that's a great uh, a cheer. Thank you. Um, I also, instead of doing a cheer, I'm going to do one more cheer. I just wanted to cheer because it uh, came up a little bit in public comment last night. Um, Officer Glenn Barrett, who is usually the sergeant at arms for the city council meetings and needs to deal with any kind of disruption or anyone who, um, you know, is acting in a way that uh, a law enforcement expert feels needs to be addressed. He's he's usually that person. He's also an SRO in our schools and um, rides on the mounted unit during the summers. He's just really incredible. And the way he's handled some of the disruptions at the city council meetings over the last couple of weeks, I think has been really incredible. And so I just wanted to give a quick cheer to Officer Barrett for everything he does for the city. All right, Great. real quick, uh, my, my cheer, and there's a little add-on, and it's a little late, but goes to the, um, the Caitlin Clark in the female NCAA tournament this year. It was amazing. It was greatness. It beat the, the beat the boys, uh, and rightfully so. It was you know I, I said greatness transcends, and it was really exciting to watch this. Unfortunately, you know we all saw that, that she's going to make seventy five thousand dollars next year in the NBA salary. Yeah. It's it's a shame, but but it, it's 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 it is um, what's the word I'm looking for? It is capitalism. So this is my this is not my plan. This is a plan. This is kind of cool part about having a, a, a teenage son is that. He comes up with these ideas or he sees them somewhere. What the WNBA should do, the WNBA should should mirror the NBA. So all Iowa fans could buy an Iowa t-shirt that covered both the boys and girls. So imagine instead of the Iowa fever, if you're a Pacers fan, you can go out and buy a Kate and Clark jersey. It's a Pacers jersey. And then have the teams play, the, the women play after the men. So you go watch a men's Pacers game and you stick around and watch the female Pacers play. I think that would drive attendance to the game. I would love to go. 
I don't know if I'd ever go watch a New York Liberty game. I'd go watch the Knicks, but I'd love to see sit away after and watch. The, and it's just a way to get exposure to the game. And it's a game that's that's growing. And I'm, I'm afraid by losing these great these great players, the, the Reese from LSU. She, I mean, she was a baller. She played hard. We're going to lose these ladies to the WNBA, and I'm, I'm worried that we're going the, the the female basketball is going to lose this momentum. So uh, I'm kicking it to the NBA to do something to keep this momentum going. I mean. I think marquee players should be paid what they're worth. It, it's to me contradictory to capitalism. I mean, could there be a more in-demand athlete than Caitlin Clark? I, I just boggles my mind the whole pay situation. Well, well, um, I, 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 you say that, but look how many tickets that the Indiana Fever are going to sell to a home game next year. It's the maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll right. sell out. But my my guess is you're not going to be watching. It. Although I take it back, I think they got like five games on uh, on national television. So so we'll see, Robin. I understand your point. My point is I still don't know if it's going to drive the the numbers and the revenue that the men's game does. But if it does, absolutely, they should be paid. I probably wouldn't go see a WNBA game just like ordinarily. But if Caitlin Clark was playing, I would be there in a heartbeat. So we well, shall I, see. But I hope that I'm wrong. I hope very I, good I hope, point. I hope she drives revenue. I hope they get paid because they are ballers. They are athletes and they deserve it. And girls to the front. I like it when you give a shout out to the girls, Adam. Thank Woo. you. Well done. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, should we wrap it up there? All right. All right, everybody follow us on all, we're on all social. You can find this podcast wherever you watch podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Saratoga Podcast. You'll get alerts when we go live and we will see you next Wednesday. Stay charming, Saratoga. Thanks for watching, folks.